Hello everyone, this is Mina. I'm a speculative fiction writer from Romania. And welcome to my channel. That is my reviewing partner. His name is Bubu. He's going to object to everything I have to say because that's how he is. Uh, today we're going to be discussing the uh, sixth episode of the TV series The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power. And as with the other five, which you can uh, find uh, also on my uh, channel if you want to check them out. As with the other five, uh, I have to warn you that uh, this will be uh, filled, riddled with spoilers. So if you haven't seen uh, the episode yet, I'd advise you to turn back and, you know, come back later. Um, also, um, I'm not watching any reviews, reactions, analysis from others before I'm posting mine because I want to have uh, my own raw and unfiltered opinion to form it without being influenced. So if there are any ideas that others have said plenty of times before or any ideas that contradict mine, uh, I'm sorry about it. I'm presenting only my uh, viewpoints and uh, I'm usually trying to, uh, you know, steer clear of uh, too many theories. I like more to analyze, like, from a literary perspective and uh, from a storyline perspective. And uh, mention the stuff that I liked, uh, some stuff that I didn't, maybe, or uh, stuff that reminds me a lot that uh, puts this TV series in the... Uh, make it fit into the Tolkien world. Um, you don't agree? <laughs> right. <laughs> also, um, those who have seen my other reviews know that I usually go storyline by storyline, but it's kind of impossible in this episode because technically there are only two storylines that kind of converge. So I'm going to discuss some of the characters that I believe uh, shine, uh, especially in this episode, and through them some of the moments that I found uh, re really, really uh, telling. I'm not going to discuss all the characters, uh, but uh, just the ones that uh, I think impressed me most in this episode. Uh, we'll start with Adar, because uh, we need to address the uh, Elephant in the room, not you. <laughs> we <laughs> that is Adar mentioning that he uh, killed uh, Sauron, which of course he didn't. Whether he thinks he did or not is uh, an entirely different matter, and uh, I'm kind of inclined to believe that at least up to this point, uh, he thought he did. But uh, Sauron is good at tricking people, especially Second Age Sauron. So, uh, you know, it could be that uh, he allowed himself to be tricked like this, knowing what Adar was going to do next, that he was going to try to go to the Southlands, offer the orcs a uh, home of their own, and... Uh, ultimately create the perfect environment for Sauron to come and do his dirty work over there. So, uh, I think that maybe Adar believes that he so color, as he so colorfully put it, puts it, gutted Sauron, but uh, I'm convinced, I mean, it's clear he didn't, but I think he was misled into thinking that he did. Uh, what I like about other in this episode is that uh, we see a lot of his dual nature and uh, his other is a mess of contradictions and a very cleverly constructed character. He tells in that scene uh, in the barn, he tells Galadiel calls him an orc and he tells her he's an Uruk, which is basically the same thing, just more politically correct. So they think. Uh, but even though he assumes this identity as an Uruk, he, at the beginning of the episode, we see him uh, 
performing what we later find out from Anondil, uh, an elvish custom. He's planting seeds. He's speaking uh, elvish. He's not only elvish, he's speaking Quenya, which is high elvish, which uh, the orcs of Sauron's age can't even stand to hear. So, despite his claim, he still clings to his roots. Uh, and yeah, he's not. Let me be clear. I don't think he's. They're trying to make him be good or sympathetic or whatever because he's not. We are trying to see his point of view, but that doesn't mean that uh, we're trying to be made to sympathize with him or his cause. And this massive contradiction uh, kind of leads us to this because he's planting seeds that are never going to grow because he's covering the sun. Those seeds aren't going to grow. He's uh, he wants to give the orcs a land of his of their own, which is fair and nice, and he wants them not to be slaves and have names and identities and that. That sounds fair. Only the land that are tr they're trying to uh, make their own is already occupied, and while he's trying to free the orcs and make them not be slaves anymore, he's going to make slaves out of uh, the Southlanders, the people who already live there. Same. Uh, he seems to care about his uh, the orcs cause and his children. He cares about them enough to uh, talk to Galadriel when she threatens them, uh, when she threatens him to, uh, you know, move the orcs into the sunlight, which of course they can't stand. But at the same time, his human allies he uses as as cannon fodder. You can't have another different name for it. He sends them first over there first as cannon fodder, which uh, is a very cold and, oh, I don't know, uh, yeah, it's a cold-blooded tactic because he also gets rid of allies that he finds unreliable and that he, ha he probably has no use for. And it also has a profound psychological impact on uh, the villagers, on the Southlanders, because realizing that they didn't know it, but they were fighting and killing their own. So, uh, no, I don't think Adar is supposed to be seen as a good character or as a sympathetic character or as a character whose cause you can relate to. The only thing that I think here is that there is still a little bit of light in Adar, same as there's still a little bit of darkness in Galadel, which Adar points out to her, actually. He recognizes that, even though uh, Galadel seems to refuse to recognize uh, you know, the light in Adar. I'm not saying the good part because, um, yeah, even if he, though he believes he's doing good, he's not, and I don't think we are supposed to think he's doing good. And uh, if we're to talk of uh, Adar's plan, that whole thing with uh, erupt, making Mount Doom erupt, which, yeah, I know a lot of people said this is what was going to happen. I was skeptical because I had no idea how they were going to do that. But uh, it was brilliant how they did that. The whole filming of this and the whole directing of this, it was nice to see the water. And uh, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure we're going to see uh, people, you know... Uh, some uh, YouTuber down the line uh, making a post with a, an angry thumbnail saying Vulcanologist reacts to whatever this scene and uh, telling us in all, uh, you know, complete, full of anger how this isn't possible. It's fantasy light, people. Lighten up. I'm sure no one expects, uh, no one is going to drop water into a volcano to see if it erupts. So, you know, just uh, take it as fantasy, and as fantasy is, it was a nice scene. So, there's that. Uh, I'll say a few brief word, words about Halbrand, <laughs> who I, I still have doubts about. And I'm going to divide this into two scenarios. If Halbrand is who he says he is, 
uh, then he is also one of the characters that has reached, you know, uh, kind of like, I'd say, rite of passage in a way for this battle. And he's a completely different person at the end of it, which uh, we see at that scene with Galadriel. And by the way, I don't think that uh, it's supposed to imply any romance between them. At least I hope not. Because, uh, you know, it's the 21st century. I think we're past the point when any relationship between a male and female character should turn into romance. So if it is this, I'm going to actually be very disappointed. Also, what's with all those elves falling for mortals? And what's with Galadiel? I mean, does it run in her family because... <laughs> <laughs> that kind of explains Arwen and, <laughs> you know, but yeah, whatever. Let's not turn this into a soap opera. I hope this isn't about romance. I hope it's just the fact that both Halbrand and Galadiel have found somebody that understands them. Because even though Galadiel has used Halbrand, there's no denying that, she's also had enough faith in him to think that he could see this task through. Which I don't think that uh, in the past uh, people had a lot of faith in Halbrand. And this moment of battle of complete trust uh, made Halbrand realize just what it feels like to have, so to have somebody, you know, believe in him and think that he's capable of a task. Which is probably why he accepts uh, to be recognized as the Southern, Southern King. And uh, he does undergo a very, uh, you know, important uh, evolution because he starts in the second episode as the guy who uh, allows his entire people, the people on the raft, he allows them to die to be killed by, the, by that serpent just to survive. And then we see him in battle riding bravely at the front with Galadiel and, uh, you know, saving Elendil's life, sparing others. So, uh, if he is genuine, he has undergone a very uh, important transformation and he is now ready uh, for his next task as King of the Southland. Now, after this very nice, uh, you know, pro Halbrand speech, uh, let's go to the other scenario, if Halbrand is Sauron, or at least not who he says he is. Because uh, there are some parts that still make me suspicious. First one is uh, how he immediately wants to kill Adar. And how he asks, do you know who I am? Do you remember me? Which, yeah, sounds... A bit because Adar does not remember him and he would not remember him if Halbrand was just you know this so random Southlander who he probably Adar had his orcs burn his village kill his wife or whatever so he wouldn't remember him unless there was direct contact and unless it was something important, and in light of Adar's re revelation about Sauron, you have to wonder. And also, uh, again in the barn, when Halbrand stops Galadiel from, uh, you know, killing Adar, she leaves, and Adar turns to Halbrand and asks, who are you? In, in a very intrigued tone, because he doesn't understand who's this person. And maybe he's starting to get suspicious. And uh, the thing is, G the next scene is, you know, Galadel on the, sitting on that boulder. And Halbrand comes a bit later. So what have they talked about, he and Adar? Did Adar maybe reveal his plan that, you know, uh... Galadiel is actually uh, carrying a random hammer, not uh, the thing he had, the key that would uh, cause Mount Doom to explode. And does Halbrand 
know what's going to happen and if it's Sauron of course he knows that oh look his his plans are coming to you know he can take advantage of the situation uh, and also uh, that part with Bronwyn at first I was afraid that uh, he and Bronwyn know each other but I don't think they do because they don't have any reason to pretend and what's intriguing is that Bronwyn looks at his pouch, looks at the sigil. That's, that, that's how she, they were told, the people, the Southlanders were told they would recognize the king. And it's, the, it's that sigil that, you know, give, gives Halbrand, legitimizes him. And I started to wonder whether, you know, was that sigil really his? Because he, he tells Galadiel, uh, I took it off. In the third episode, he says that he took it off a dead man. And he also says, uh, after, in the fifth, I think, episode, that he did something terrible. And I, th I th at first I thought that he was from Bronwyn's village and revealed where the sword was, where the key was, whatever it was. But no, I, I think it wasn't. I think that uh, he might have, even if he's not Sauron, that he might have killed the real king of the Southlands. Maybe I'm going too deep. Or maybe, you know, I, I just don't want to let go of uh, this uh, little theory of mine. But, uh, you know, if, if he is uh, Sauron, uh, Miriel just toasted to... Him and yeah, I, I think it's gonna be a very embarrassing moment if Numenor just legitimized him in such a manner. But we'll see. We we have two more episodes left, and if he turns out not to be Sauron, I'm going to, uh, you know, admit on camera that I was wrong. That's that. Uh, moving on to Bronwyn. This episode, I think, is really Bronwyn's episode in a lot of ways. And uh, she... I, I think out of all the original characters, uh, she's my favorite. She And really, from the start, I was uh, intrigued by her. But the problem is she had so little screen time that it was hard to focus on her, but... Now that she was given more screen time, yeah, I I really like her as a character. And um, I think uh, a lot of people, especially nowadays, don't really know how to do female characters well. They try to make them, yeah, strong and capable, but they kind of make them not real, kind of more like robots, like they devoid of any weakness because kind of like i don't know for whatever reason and by the way i'm not talking about galadiel here galadiel doesn't Gal Gal galadiel is a different problem altogether and it's more about the way she can't let go of, of her anger and not the way that she thinks she's better than every than anyone she doesn't she shows respect to people when they're worthy of it she shows it to Miriel, she, so, she shows it to Elendil, so... Yeah, but m returning to Bronwyn. Yeah, Bronwyn is a very strong, determined character, but uh, not in a flashy way. And she's not afraid of showing uh, vulnerability. She's not afraid of showing, like, a more uh, gentle side and a more nurturing side, because she's a healer. And in Tolkien's world, healers are quite important. Aragorn was a healer. So this, this actually makes her closer to being a, a hero in Tolkien terms than if she was only a warrior or, you know, something like that. So, um, yeah, uh, I think... Well, first of all, I'm very glad. I, I knew that she wouldn't give in because we saw her in the next episode. We saw her wavering. And uh, now that she's past this moment of crisis, 
she's determined to see this through until the very end. And I think one of the most, uh, one of the moments when she shines truly and completely is that scene with Theo. And not only because what she says is like a nod, very clear nod to Lord of the Rings and something that, uh, well, Sam says it in the movies, the quote is kind of split twice. We have part of it with the shadow is only a passing thing and uh, which in the movies Sam says to Frodo and Osgiliath and in the, the other part uh, there's light and beauty forever beyond its reach that Sam says uh, in uh, Return of the King in uh, the extended edition uh, where they're in Mordor and he notices he notices a star beyond the clouds. So, but in the book, uh, it's Sam doesn't really say it. It's kind of an epiphany that he has a moment of epiphany while he is in Mordor with Frodo. Frodo is asleep and Sam is looking up and he sees the evening star and he thinks that no matter what happens to him and to Frodo, there's always be, there will always be, uh, you know, something left behind, light and beauty that no shadow can touch. And any shadow is a passing thing. And I like it that it's Bronwyn that says that. And that is apparently something that she uses uh, to, you know, uh, she used to calm her uh, child with this when he was younger. And uh, I think what I like most is that it's Theo who asks her to tell him that. Theo, who's been quite cocky, understandably, because uh, he's 14, he, he's not going to admit to his mother that he's got, he's afraid he's got problems. But who's been quite, you know, self-assured and cocky and a little bit antagonistic at times, even towards Bronwyn. And he is now ready to open up. And he's like drops his defenses and allows himself this moment of vulnerability that is really, it's a very human moment, very tender. And yeah, I liked it. It was quite, uh, quite touching. And uh, I think I, I like the quiet moments in this episode more than, I do like the action scenes. They were awesome. They kept me, it was a, you know, 50 minutes adrenaline rush. My my hands were shaking afterwards. But uh, it's the quiet moments where, uh, you know, this shines and where the the relationship to Tolkien's work is seen clearer. Another character that uh, really stood out in this uh, episode is Anandir. And... Uh, yeah, apart from his action scenes, because really, who doesn't want to see uh, cool action scenes with elves shooting at arrows? I mean, you can't have Middle Earth without that. You can't have Lord of the Rings without that, anything. But um, I think that he also reaches a point, like Bronwyn, uh, like Halbrand, where th there's kind of like this uh, kind of fulfillment of, you know, becoming something better because for 70 plus years he's been uh, supervising these people. He's been a reminder that they could go bad. He's in very many ways, he's, uh, you know, uh, been, uh, he's been, uh, you know, put, dragging these people down, him and the other elves. Because you can't become a better person if the, somebody around you tells you that you ha it's in your nature to become evil. And uh, this is something that Arondir was never comfortable with. And it was more than just uh, his attraction to Bronwyn. I think he general, genuinely believed that those people could be good and that they should be left alone. And now here he is actually 
bringing these people up, encouraging them, showing them that they can defeat the enemy. And I think that's uh, like a moment of fulfillment for him. And um, yeah, you can see him that, you know, he looks like he's doing something that he wants to be doing instead of something that makes him uncomfortable, which was how he was at, in the first episode. And uh, yeah, also the scene with him and Bronwyn. And uh, as I said many times, I'm not usually a fan of romance, but I like their love story. It's, you know, it's actually quite touching. And, you know, that scene when he shows the Alfin in seeds, tells him, tells Bronwyn about the Elven custom, about, you know, as Bronwyn says, new life in defiance of death, which, by the way, is a quintessential part of uh, Tolkien's work. Because uh, you have, for example, uh, that moment in the Lord of the Rings with uh, Frodo and Sam on the road to, uh, at the crossroads, at, with the statue of the king that's defiled, that the head is thrown off, and you have that uh, flower that's, you know, like a crown. So it started to grow around the stone head like a crown. Or you have it also uh, when, um, after the coronation, when uh, Gandalf takes Aragorn outside the city, and tells him to look where everything was barren before, and that's where Aragorn finds uh, the sapling of the white tree. So this idea of new life through where everything is barren, you know, the shadow being a passing thing and new life coming back, this is quintessential Tolkien. And uh, that's why that scene is, again, one of the best of this episode. Also, the nod to Yavanna, which one uh, Anander says about uh, the Valar who watches over. And I like that, you know, both uh, Anander and Bronwyn, they save each other. They, they have a very, I don't know, uh, well-balanced relationship that uh, it's kind of hard to observe in a lot of uh, works of fiction. So I think if I could compare it, uh, to any other fictional romance, uh, I'd compare it to, I know how many of you are familiar with Babylon 5 TV series, the science fiction TV series, but I'd really compare it with uh, Sheridan and the Lan. Both because, yeah, they're from potentially, not necessarily hostile, but races that don't really trust each other, and that they are, you know, so well tuned to one another and uh, work so well both personally professionally and yeah i think that's that's how i'd uh what i'd compare it to which yeah it's a good thing uh now um yeah i i i've started to go very very long so <laughs> This again is gonna last quite a lot, so I'm I'm gonna move to my last uh, last point, which is uh, Isildur and Elendil. I can't discuss one separately over the other because a lot of the scenes with Elendil are connected to Isildur, so we'll put them together. Uh, I I know I said in previous reviews that I was a bit hesitant about Isildur, and I had no idea where the show was going with him and uh i th i think I, I had the impression that they were focusing too much on the end point and on the end point uh connected to movie isildur not ne necessarily tolkien's version of isildur uh, but uh i've seen I, i've seen an interview with uh, the actor who plays him recently and uh I kind of started to understand their approach and I saw that he had a lot of passion and respect for the source material and a lot of care and understanding for the character himself 
so I, I actually that's when I thought uh, you know I'm not gonna worry anymore it's if he's the one uh, Isildur is in good hands you know with him portraying with if he's the one portraying him uh, and yeah th th this this episode uh, cemented this belief in in me because uh yeah we did get to see uh, Isildur shining in this episode and also reaching a sort of uh yeah i would say rite of passage for, with the battle with uh, you know a different understanding of life i think and he seems at the end of the episode he seems well, not exactly at the end of the episode, but in that moment before everything goes to hell again, uh, he seems uh, much more at peace with himself and with the world around him. Uh, I like the scenes with Bedek, and I do hope they haven't killed the horse. Please, you do not do this. Really, you have a lot of original characters to choose from. Don't kill the horse. <laughs> and I liked how uh, he met Galadel. I was looking forward, actually, to the two of them meeting and interacting. <laughs> and I like that he blurts out this uh, Kinar, the eyes of the elves, which is something that his descendant will say thousands and thousands of years afterwards. Because, uh, yeah, Aragorn says that in the Two Towers, in the book. Tells Legolas when he's, uh, when Legolas spots the the riders of Rohan. <laughs> so yeah, I I'm sure he says it less awkwardly than Isildur does because Isildur looks like he he just says the first thing that comes into his mind. He's a little bit awkward around Galadriel, but yeah, understandably, and also that um. You know, when the, he sees the land as well and the sunset, and he's so in awe. And, um, yeah, uh, and also, um, we actually discover much more about him through what uh, Elendil tells Galadiel. And that scene, uh, with Elendil and Galadiel, uh, is very telling from two, two points. One, because we have, uh, you know, Elendil's foresight, which is, uh, you know, something that, uh, again, also Aragorn will have when, like, for example, when he tells uh, Gandalf that he shouldn't go to Moria, that uh, Gandalf will be in danger if he goes to Moria. So that, you know, touch of foresight that, uh, that he has that apparently Elendil has too. But another thing that makes this scene uh, quite uh, important is that we finally find out what happened to Isildur's mother, to Elendil's wife. And uh, I think I should have known. I think we should have suspected this. And it, it casts light to a lot of scenes from previous episodes. More notably, the scene in episode 3, uh, when they're uh, repeating that the cadets are repeating that mantra, the sea is always right, which I found extremely disturbing, and now I think it's even more disturbing. <laughs> because, you know, I, I thought Isildur was muttering it and looking so uncomfortable because he didn't want to, you know, he didn't want to go with, with the mold, with all the rest. Like, he wanted to be a bit... A bit of, of a rebel, but of a misfit. But I think it's much more. I mean, I know now. I know it's much more than that. And having the kid whose mother just drowned repeat the sea is always right is cruel, sadistic, and extremely disturbing. And because I think it's making kind of like forcing uh, Isildur to accept something that he's definitely not ready to accept. I don't think Elendil is either, because the way he also says the phrase, like, completely emotionless, like he's repeating it, uh, like, on a, you know, 
from sense memory. He's not he's not feeling it. He's just repeating it without shutting off all emotions. Because of course, you know, if if you say the sea is always right, then it's right that she drowned. The sea was right when she drowned, and he can't accept that. And you can't force somebody to accept that. And now I actually take back what I said in previous episodes about Isildur being a bit, having a lot of issues, because in the light of this, I think he's actually quite well balanced if this is what he has to go through every day. And yeah, it's, it's a bit uh, disturbing. Another scene, another scene that uh, is explained, looking back through this this revelation that Isildur's mother, Elendil's wife, drowned, is that scene in the, the previous episode, in episode five, when um, the ship blows up, blows up, and uh, Keman and Isildur come from the water. Uh, because. We've seen Elendil so far, we've seen him lose his temper once, yeah. But we haven't seen him really... Uh, he's usually quite composed. I mean, Galadriel was pointing a sword at him at one point, knife actually, at him at one point, and all he did was... He didn't even blink, he just told her in a very... <laughs> you know, roundabout way that she was acting like a child and we've we've seen him in a lot of uh, uncomfortable situations and he hasn't really uh, shown that much emotion he's able to control his emotions very very well and he's very composed and in that scene when he rushes to Isildur he's panicked he's freaked really that that's kind of like the most emotion that we see from him at that at this point and yeah, now I now I understand why because you know if if his wife drowned and seeing his son out, out there in the water, peril of drowning, probably is not the. He's probably not very comfortable and he can't keep his emotions in check, and probably that's also the reason why he in the end allows Isildur to, or to accompany them. And uh, with that in mind, I do like that in the end they've reached out towards each other. And that scene with the horse, where again it echoes uh, Aragorn's own behavior, this time movie Aragorn, when uh, Elendil comes, Isildur, comes, comes, yeah, he actually comes, comes to calm Isildur down as well, but he starts with Bedek because probably that's easier. Uh, when he comes back like, using uh, Elvish, which is the same thing that a uh, movie Aragorn does with, with Brego in Two Towers. <laughs> and it, I actually see Aragorn in both of them, in both Elendil and Isildur. And it's gorgeous, really. Both bits and pieces in both of them. And I think that's why they're both becoming my favorite characters of the show. And I like that they kind of, the same way as uh, Theo drops his own defenses in front of Bronwyn, gradually Isildur drops his defenses in front of Elendil. And like allows... Uh, allow, they both allow each other to, you know, meet each other halfway. And that was, I think that was my favorite scene from all the show. It, it was so heartwarming. And so, you know, in the midst of all the, that chaos, I, I think that's, there's, you know, it was like one of the best, the best scenes of the show. And I really have to congratulate uh, the, the showrunners for, and the writers and, you know, for keeping the relationships very Tolkien, you know, because Tolkien writes relationships that are very wholesome most of the time. And I like that he 
people here are trying, you know, if they have a problem, they talk it out in the end. Even if it takes time, they still talk it out and reach some form of compromise, some form of... They don't just break relationships and, you know, on a whim. So I think... I think in this respect... Um, yeah, I I do like the re the way the relationships are portrayed in this uh in this show, and yeah, that that scene with Ellen Delany Sildo will will really remain one of my favorites. If not, it's definitely my favorite moment from episode six. It's probably among my top ten moments from the entire show. But there are still two episodes left, so we'll see in the next few weeks how it goes. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next week.